picture it. Every character has a catchphrase. Every animal has a new name. There are no family members in sight, but there is an abundance of magic. And oh my God, is that Beyonce? Beyonce Wiles Wuzzleberg is shine. To the video, to the show. I'm here. Wow, 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 butt lovers. Welcome back to the Lore series where we explore shows and commercials that one time that no one else is brave enough to. Now, as always, these videos are not meant for kids even though we're discussing kids' media. This is for the purpose of nostalgia and entertainment for an older audience. We ask questions where the answer could easily be, I don't know, it's a kid's show. But we take it far too seriously. No one ever listens to that disclaimer and I get complaints anyway, so I don't know why I bother. But Wow Wow Wubsy aired new episodes on Nickelodeon from 2006 to 2010. It ran for two seasons and totaled 52 episodes. There were also two specials, but both of those contained a huge chunk of episodes. More on that later. This series has such a unique and wholesome origin story that I just have to share with you. But first, shout out to the Wow Wow Wubsy Wiki for being surprisingly thorough and helpful during this research process. So the first time we saw the prototypes for Wubsy Widget and Walden was in a comic book titled The Tale of Flopsy, Mopsy, and Ted, which was created by Bob Boyle, the creator of Wow Wow Wubsy, and his niece. Look at how cute this is. But something interesting to note is the character Mopsy, who resembles Wubsy the most, is a girl, whereas Wubsy in the series is a boy. And with headlines like this, that subtle difference stands out even more. Why did Wubsy have to be a boy, I wonder? I'll introduce you to the main character's general vibe and reception of the series before we get into bottom of the iceberg type stuff. Wubsy is the titular character. He's a young sprightly dude who uses his tail as a spring, loves playing kickity kickball, and enjoys hanging out with and helping his friends. His catchphrase is, wow, wow, wow. What can I say? They're branding geniuses but it is met with mixed reception. Many people think it's cute, endearing, and perfectly reflects his enthusiastic nature, while others find it to be very grating. I have to fall somewhere in the middle because every time it hits my eardrum wrong, I remind myself that I don't have to be an adult watching the series. At the same time, does he have to say it over 500 times? Yes, this is a screenshot from the incredible characters wiki. The fandom is alive and well. So what is Wubsy exactly? So early on and we've already reached our first dilemma. The species is never disclosed, but it is a classic case of human-like animals living in buildings, talking in the same language, and animal-like animals just doing what they do. Wikipedia describes Wubsy as a yellow mouse-like creature. Who's that Pokemon? It's Pikachu! Now, Widget is his friend. She likes to build. She hammers and she saws and her toolbox is filled. Aside from the theme song making my job way too easy and being a bop and a half, this is a very musical series and you're not ready for when I rank the songs, which doesn't sound like it would be necessary, but it is. Anyway, Widget is a classic inventor type character. Her catchphrase is, oops, that wasn't supposed to happen. And even though she is obviously the main character with the clearest animal type inspiration, she is still referred to as a rabbit-like creature, which makes sense because we've also seen animal rabbits throughout the series. Now Walden, he's really smart. Do not quote the theme song again. You have to come up with something else to say. He knows about science and books and art. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Walden is the level-headed one. His catchphrase is either yes, 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 or no, 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 but never maybe, maybe, maybe. It's just too many syllables. Anyway, he's very parental and I spend most of the time throughout the series feeling bad for him. What a shocker. I will get into the dynamic of their friendship because of the episodic nature of the show. Sometimes their friendship goals very supportive and loving and other times they overstep serious boundaries with no real consequences. And even though I should just take the show at face value, not only is that impossible for me to do, but also that would be a really uninteresting watch. So, oh my, oh my God, God will you just let me, me do, do what I need, I need to, to do? do? Oh, and Daisy is the other main character introduced and thrown into the main group in season Season two. Voiced by Tara Strong, who's really channeling bubbles, and her catchphrase is lavender lollipops. Fuck it, I can do better than that. I know, I know I just came over a sinus infection, but I can do better than that. Lavender lollipops! Lavender lollipops! Daisy is. I'll have a whole section dedicated to how bizarre this addition to the group is because I have such mixed feelings. Honestly, I feel more positive about her presence overall, but the introduction was. I'm getting ahead of myself. First, let's look at the very mixed reviews. The Best TV Shows Wiki lists off its positive traits, which includes its huggable animation, which I'd have to agree with, and it's the perfect way to describe it, honestly. In fact, I think this is the show's strongest attribute, not even joking. The pastels in this geometric but not too sharp world really make it cozy and pleasant to look at, while giving you a childlike, rose-colored glasses, nostalgia-filled feeling. The Wiki also gives credit to the voice actors, which I also have to fully agree with, and especially between the three 
three OG main characters, there's a lot of variety there. The reviews in Common Sense Media are right down the middle, with the most positive reviews from parents stating, Colorful and fun. My two-year-old really likes the music, and she laughs with every episode. It's fast-paced and fun to watch. Both my three-year-old and seven-year-old boys love this show, and it's one of the few kid shows that I actually don't mind them watching. Not blaring loud, not in your face, and no disrespectful talk. The characters celebrate their differences and learn how to live with each other. I wish there were more shows like this. While the lowest review from a parent reads, For the most part, I am okay with this show, and I do allow my daughter to watch it. The issues I have are in the episode where Bubsy goes to school and hates his teacher and doesn't like school. It seems to me that this is a way to get kids to already have problems with school from the get-go. Not to um actually this review, but the only reason it bothers me is that's not at all what happens in the episode. Wubsy hears rumors of what going to school is like, and he gets a little fearful until he actually goes and loves it. The kids' reviews are much more blunt. Ah, this show has been airing for six years, and yet it still seems popular. This is one of the worst preschool shows I've ever seen. The actors are all wasted here. My favorite Nick Jr. show. This show was around on Nick Jr. when I was little. I think I might have seen it when I was two. But then, I just had forgotten about this show. But one day I found it on YouTube until I was kicked out of YouTube. And now I go on YouTube Kids instead. Oh, this show is like the worst to me. And it's so annoying. And the theme song is just don't bother. Catchy theme song and soundtrack, talented voice acting, good lessons like Don't Lie, original stories in Dino Land, cute designs, good flash animation, Beyonce was in it, it's like Spongebob and Mickey Mouse on Noggin, but it only had two seasons, that's a short that- Whoopsie is stupid, the animation is weird, and the theme song is too catchy! Anyway, enough about opinions of people other than me. <laughs> this is my channel, what do I think? I'll read you through some of my first impressions. Hi, how are you? So the first episode of the series really sets up Wubsy as this innocent child that needs to be protected. He He's dealing with a lot of other kids calling his tale strange and not wanting to be his friend because of it. A quote by me, I wasn't ready for this emotional damage this early. This first episode also establishes his friendship with Widget and Walden. And that left me with more questions rather than answers. Because they are clearly older than him and act like parental figures. But Widget specifically doesn't really see the root of the issue, instead trying to fix his tale to make him more normal. Which, as someone who's older than him, why the hell are you encouraging this? Just a terrible influence. Why are you not uplifting the poor lad? This is, of course, to prolong the conflict and get to the solution of self-love at the very, very end. But here's the strange thing. Now that Wubsy's embracing his tail, people like him, but it's less like showing off an insecurity and more so being like, look how badass it is. Which... It is, and that's valid. But sometimes the things you're insecure about aren't badass, so what do you do then? I'm insecure about this pimple on my face, but maybe if I make a show of it, everyone will love it. Are you guys ready for Dr. Pimple Popper Super Soaker Extravaganza? <laughs> Dare I say, the lesson was kind of butt and not in a good way. Like, all of those kids at the beginning were brutal. They were really mean to him, and they didn't say sorry, and now all of a sudden they're friends. Boo! That's not how that should work! Before we go more in depth about the questionable lessons and friendship moments, let's first go over the ecosystem and the inconsistencies of the animal kingdom. We have stretchulumps, tiny honkers, the speckled flying frogs, which are barely speckled and don't fly, bellyachus majaceus, this poor eternally in pain bellyache creature, polar apotamus, squawkosaurus, and these doodle bugs which look like little crayons and doodle. As you can see, these creatures have extravagant susy names and other world qualities to distinguish themselves from their real-life counterparts. Or do they? So throughout the show, these creatures are called flutterflies, which is a better name for them than butterflies if we're being honest with ourselves. Anyway, Wubsy loves watching them and chasing them, and every time he does so, he calls them flutterflies. Have you seen that flutterfly? But in season one, episode 1B, he says butterflies. Oh, she's catching butterflies. Butterflies which may be a different species if we're giving them a little wiggle room in the writing. But butterflies as we know them was never mentioned again. On the more mystical side, in season one, episode 14a, the snowshoe shoe is a mythical creature that hides away from most, but has a very interesting relationship with Walden. Go off, I guess. We also see Dinosaur Island for the first time in season one, episode 15a. All the dinosaurs live on Dino Island. Is Wuzzleburg the afterlife? Were they dead the whole time? No, I refuse to do that. Season 1, episode 20A, Wubsy mentions a belly fant, which I can only assume is different from the multiple elephants we've heard about and seen throughout the series. So we have flutterflies slash butterflies, belly fants slash elephants. And now in season 2, episode 4B, we are introduced to the adorable unihorn. But in season 2, episode 10B, the exact same creature is called a unicorn. Rainbow unicorn? So do they know? 
know they're speaking in this like baby language. That's very contradictory because Walden with his scientific books has the scientific terms and those scientific terms are usually the cutesy extravagant names. But then they'll just use our words for things episodes later. Maybe when they say our names for things, it's more like slang to them or maybe the writers just forgot. Which listen, this never would have came to light if I wasn't on the case. So it's understandable that they thought they could get away with this. Also lack of care for these creatures isn't out of character for this universe. In season one, episode 2B, there is a pet truck. This dude is selling pets in tiny, tiny cages to children without their parental supervision for 50 cents. As Wubsy's walking away, this sketchy pet cart guy calls after him that what he just bought is called a flegal and they require very specific care. Information that would have been useful before the transaction, to be honest. The adults in this universe, as you will see even more, are, dare I say, useless? I understand the overarching plot of this series is Wubsy learning and growing from his mistakes, but could the adults consistently help him? Do the stakes have to be this high and involve another living creature? If you keep this up, you might have to join the club for permanently endangering tiny animals otherwise known as PETA. The special care this pet truck sketchy fuck didn't outright say to Wubsy is that a flegal grows when it's given candy and multiplies when it's given bologna sandwiches. Just a more strange, more specific gremlin. It's so cool that you just gave that away to a four-year-old. <laughs> like, that's awesome. Another example of lack of care for animals and way too much trust in Wubsy is in season one, episode 20B, Zoo Bullabaloo. While the zoo habitats are being fixed, the zookeeper decides Wubsy's house is a great place for them to stay in the meantime, while Wubsy and Walden watch Watch them. Totally qualified, nothing can go wrong. The more we look at the big picture, this lack of care extends beyond just the animal-like creatures, because how old is Wubsy? Who is watching him? What do you mean he lives alone in this house? A child. No. Season 1, Episode 3A, Wubsy in the Woods, when Wubsy, a, a child, child, runs off alone, Widget calls after him, wait, you shouldn't go alone, rare Widget W, but then Walden says to her, we have to find a map. And then they just leave as Wubsy goes alone without a map. There is no urgency to protect, even though they're clearly the older ones in the situation. And I hesitate to even say adults until season one, episode 10A. This episode opens with Wubsy jumping out of bed in a dapper outfit, ready to go to his first day of school. No sign of his parents or guardians anywhere in this house or anywhere in this series. He lives in this house tree by himself. And it seems as though the other kids, Buggy, Huggy, and Earl also don't have a support system because at their young age, before their first day of school, they're all skipping. How do you skip on your first day of preschool at some random ass playground? Where are your parents? How do you afford your own house? A asking for a friend. I thought Ash going around the world on his own adventures at 10 was wild. These kids are like four. I think a lot of these older shows wrote kids without heavy parental supervision to appear less naggy and more fun loving and adventurous and to empower the kids more. And I feel like we're seeing the opposite of that in modern day cartoons where they're showing, hey, you can't have a healthy relationship with your family that exists. Anyway, Walden is the teacher of the school. So that one source I saw that said he was a high schooler, that's absolute bullshit. He is a fully grown man. See Season 1, episode 11A, after all this horror movie shenanigans, Wubsy is still too afraid to fall asleep and asks his friends to sleep over. And this image screams legal guardians. Though apparently they're not, they're just his casual adult friends. Uncle Larry. In Ask for a Little Help, they mention Uncle Larry and show this mustached man who looks a lot like Wubsy. In the Gift of Joy song, another one of Wubsy's uncles is seen, as well as his aunt, who he seems a little bit afraid of, which is kind of sad considering we don't see much of his family. And when we do see them, I'd love to see positive interactions since they're never there. There's also this grandma-like person scene. When looking up more information on Wubsy's parents, all I could find were these fan-made creations from a fan-made series, but nothing canonical. So let's talk about the closest things he has to parents, his adult friends, and the tumultuous, yet at times sweet dynamic they all share. There's three of us. Are they good friends? As I said earlier, this is a surprisingly complex question to answer. At best, they are the most caring, uplifting, nurturing group. And at worst, they're clingy, entitled, and rude. Season 1, Episode 5B, Widget and Wubsy told Walden to his face that he's not cool, laying it on very thick that these are flawed characters, which in some ways I can appreciate. You know what it reminds me of? The juxtaposition of how cute and innocent this show looks with how rude the characters can be sometimes kind 
of reminds me of Animal Crossing. Season 1, episode 4B, they ended this episode in a completely wild way, where Wubsy breaks out in spots, exclaims he thinks he's allergic to what he just ate, and then Widget and Walden just laugh. They just laugh with glee. Uh, I think I'm allergic to marshmallows. <laughs> Season 1, episode 6B, they apologize to Widget for making her feel left out. Possible character growth, or does this just depend on who's writing the episode and how silly they feel that day? I don't know. Season 1, episode 12B, this is less about how nice they are to each other, and more so how nice they are in general. So first things first, I know a wacky cartoony chase scene when I see one. It's classic shenanigans, we all love it. But this further cements that the morals of these characters fluctuate when presented with a goal they're fixated on. Running over an old lady and a fruit salesman because you need to get a toy for your friend? I mean, it is very childish, and when a kid wants something so, so bad, it's hard for them to think about the consequences of their action in pursuit of getting said thing they want. So I can excuse Wubsy a little bit, but Walden? What are you doing, man? Wubsy almost always comes out of everything scot-free to me. Maybe it's just cute privilege. But Widget and Walden's decrepit elderly asses need to do better. Something else that I find very interesting about Wubsy's decision making is he talks to us, the audience, a lot. Breaking the fourth wall and even revealing lies in front of the people he's lying to. To us, but somehow they don't hear. Just like how he doesn't hear us when we tell him the things he's doing are wrong. We are his conscience, but he will never learn. Season 1, episode 15b, Widget gets the bluey blues. Widget goes into a sadness spiral when her machine doesn't work. Dramatic, yes. Realistic, also yes. So Walden and Wubsy are so quick to try and cheer her up. It's as sweet as it is kind of concerning. They go through such great lengths, and it's like, why are you this worried this fast. It's been three seconds. She'll survive being sad for three seconds, I can assure you. They are deathly afraid of negative emotions in this world. You know we're gonna get into it all, but first, season one, episode 16b, Widget and Wubsy trick Walden into wearing a mind control helmet. First of all, show me an ethical inventor character other than Phineas and Ferb challenge. Second of all, I'm starting to notice a pattern. Walden is definitely the punching bag of this group, but I have to give credit where credit is due. Because the episode T for the for sure shows their friendship off the best. Because while they're having this tea party, they all share the same level of enthusiasm, they have some fun banter going on, and when things go wrong, it actually goes right. Because while Walden initially wanted everything to go perfectly according to his book, he's realizing he's been having fun with his friends the whole time regardless. Aww. It took a while, but I'm starting to see how this friendship works and actually benefits everyone, and it plays into each of their character archetypes. Walden keeps the others grounded, but sometimes Sometimes you just gotta live a little. Unfortunately, the next episode, season one, episode 18A, Come Spy With Me, is one of the worst. So Widge and Wubsy notice that Walden is acting strangely, come to the conclusion that he's keeping a secret from them, and decide to spy on him. As usual, all these things could just be chalked up to cartoony shenanigans, but because of the young demographic, and I'm going to sound like a Karen as usual, but I wish there was a clearer message at the end where there were a bit more consequences. Like, no, you can't do that. Like it was such a cute ending of Walden setting up a surprise for all of them, and he knew they were spying on him all along, so it was all cool and chill, but what if it wasn't? What if he just needed a day to himself and these clingy pains in the yams just ruined it? Like I said, it wasn't that deep in this specific scenario, but it's weird to see characters do something that is objectively bad and the outcome is always so chill. It seems like nothing can tear apart these friends. Season 1, episode 19b, Wubsy in the middle, their friendship is torn apart. Widget and Walden are having a huge friendship fight because Widget's machine makes a huge mess of Walden's area, which just seems par for the course. And when trying to help, Walden accidentally broke Widget's machine, which also doesn't seem like a big deal because it probably would have just broke anyway. As always, I will give credit where credit is due. There was another wonderful friendship moment in season one, episode 23A, where Widget and Walden want to make sure Wubsy doesn't have FOMO while he's recovering from his tail injury. And as well as that, their friendship is a lot more stable in season two. And lastly, I love how fully platonic Walden and Widget are. I didn't even realize how much I appreciated this dynamic until the season two episode Cupid's Little Helper. 
where basically Cupid makes people fall in love with his little bubble-blowing wand, which I thought was all fun until he started making human-like creatures and animal-like creatures falling in love. But all of this goes even more to shit when Wubsy unintentionally starts using the wand not knowing of its power, and Walden falls in love with Widget. And while he's going goo-goo, it is very difficult and awkward to watch. Oh, Widget, your ears are so long. Those two are so 1000% platonic that the mere suggestion of this relationship shift is uncomfortable. Widget is literally like, get away from me. And when Walden snaps out of it, he's like, what am I doing? So I will give this show this. It's really nice to see a male and female friendship with no weird undertones. The same can't be said for Wubsy and Daisy, who pretty much have confirmed crushes on each other. Now I'm not saying they aren't compatible, but what I am saying is, let's look at the differences between season one and season two. There's four of us. Let's read through my notes for the season two premiere, Who's That Girl? So the first thing I noticed is how they shoehorned her into the theme song. Instead of, and when they are together, the fun never ends. It's, and when they're with Daisy, the fun never ends. Which I find way funnier than it actually is. Because Widget and Walden have entire sections that talk about what makes them unique and their personalities and the things that they're interested in. And then they're like, and Daisy's here too. Which is how I remembered her character before I rewatched, to be honest, so. So in her debut, she grew her own house. She's Wubsy's new neighbor and new friend. And she also seemingly lives alone, even though she too is a, a child. child. This is just a normal thing here. Daisy is a great age-appropriate friend for Wubsy, but at first I was weirded out by her presence because she was screaming Mary Sue. Until season two, episode 23A, What a Card, when Wubsy and Daisy only hang out with Earl because he has a football card they want. Not only is this the first rude and downright mean thing we've ever seen Daisy do, which is honestly kind of refreshing, but their actions hurt Earl's feelings. An actual negative reaction and consequence to their bullshit before the reconciliation. Well handled, well done. Back to my reactions for the beginning of season two before we move on. I completely forgot about the jukebox robot. Do I enjoy the jukebox robot? It's so hard to tell because every time he sings the same song, I think, oh, this guy again. But most of the time, I don't just skip past his part, which is something I can easily do. Context for this next part, in season one, episode 7B, we saw the Wub Club Clubhouse for the first time. And it was so badass until these reoccurring loser beavers destroyed it just for shits and giggles. They really don't give a damn. <laughs> Jump forwards to season two, episode 1B, and the clubhouse is back again. And Daisy, I guess, is friends with Walden and Widget now. All of this happened off screen. I don't know. That sounds like it could have made for a fun episode, guys. What are we doing here? That really annoyed me. Like, we never saw the introduction of Walden and Widget to the new main character. The rest of the season ran as usual and even had some of the strongest episodes of the entire series. I just wish the beginning wasn't so rushed. I'm really getting passionate about this now. Magic! With the existence of Marshmallow, Mellow Trees and Dinosaur Island, I knew their reality was very different from ours. But the use of magic in this world still shocked me as its presence went from something overlooked and just slice of life to very prevalent and very powerful. We are introduced to Mumu the Magician in season one, episode 10B. And listen, he's more than just a magician. He's a magic man. He's on his Wizards of Waverly place shit. He has a magician hat shaped bus. So first of all, he's rich and he made it go through the ground. That's not sleight of hand. That's not an illusion. That is distorting reality, my guy. So in this episode, he's teaching everybody magic, but he's not actually teaching them anything. Like it doesn't require any skill. He just said, okay, turn your water into milk. And everyone was able to do that except for Wubsy. But Wubsy still changed the water. He changed it instead of milk. He changed it to creamed spinach, which to be honest, I would appreciate more. I would like that trick more. So I guess the magic wands is where the real magic is coming from. And Mumu is just the most powerful wielder. Next, they learn to pull a rabbit out of a hat. And wait, why was Widget able to make the most? Huh. The next thing we learn about Mumu the Magical Magician Man is in season one, episode 12B, where we see he has a family. Is this allowed? A whole wife and child, to be exact. Which is magic in and of itself. Because we don't see a whole lot of families. We already established this. I guess non-broken families being more rare is kind of accurate. Season one, episode 17A, Wubsy's Magical Mess Up, we see Mumu turn an object into various things, which gets Wubsy absolutely hyped. Mumu then says, direct quote, using a magic wand takes lots and lots 
lots of practice. One day you'll be ready, but not today. But like, we've seen your magic classes, dude. We know that's not true. Lots and lots of practice. What are you talking about? It's very straightforward. It's making me think he just wants to oversee all of the magic. Now, is this to ensure that the rest of Wuzzleberg is safe? Or is this just to ensure that he stays the most powerful magic user? Later in the episode, Wubsy makes his kickity kickball and the toy barrel full of monkeys come to life and turns his scooter into an elephant. This shows that the magic really doesn't have any bounds. So it is dangerous. And while I don't think everybody should have access to it, I don't think it should be hogged by one person either. And at the end of the episode, when Wubsy says Wabra Kadinkle, he turns his friends into these different looking creatures. And I don't know if it's just me, but they look otherworldly. Which it looks like she's going out to get milk for Richard Watterson only to never return. What the fuck am I looking at? After that episode is the episode Mumu Snoozity Snooze, where Mumu is sleepwalking and doing magic spells in his sleep. And these spells are strangely targeted. He made Daisy's house disappear, woke up Widget and stole her alarm clock and sent Walden away on a train. I feel like maybe he doesn't like these guys as much as he says he does because his subconscious mind is just targeting them. Also, since he's the most magical man in all of Wesselberg, can he come up with a solution so that this doesn't happen in the future? Maybe lock your magic wand away in a separate cupboard? As an overseer of almost all the magic, this seems like a massive oversight. Also, when he returns home, why is he not with his wife? Do they sleep in separate rooms? Oh my god. Maybe he was doing spells in his sleep spiraling from the magical divorce. Damn. Damn. Well, let's make up our minds on what to do about Mumu because a new threat is approaching. The first time we're introduced to extraterrestrials is in season one, episode 9A, but it's treated more like a throwaway joke. It's that classic kid show fake out of, turns out there were no aliens after all. And then the last shot is an alien actually being there and it's like, Ooh, Whoa! Also, I'm sorry, this is the alien. This definitely looks like part of their world, minus maybe the craters. Looking like the son of Chuck and Cheese, please. But the plot thickens and the episode fly us to the moon, when the people of Wesselberg wake up and it's morning, but the night sky is still out. The reason for this is the man on the moon is asleep and he's supposed to drive the moon across the sky. So they have to go to the moon and wake him up. Widget, who has messed up several inventions, somehow makes a flawless rocket. So they travel into space and they have a lot of the same planets we do. So we know for a fact that their solar system has Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Past those planets is the dark zone with very territorial aliens. There's also a toll in space where they have to pay to continue flying, which you laugh, but this is the future Musk and Bezos want, okay? Also, why did they have to travel that far to get to their planet's moon? And while we're on the subject, what? is this world even? They have planets from our solar system, as I said, and in the season two episode, Super Special Gift, a map of the world is seen where we see landmarks and places associated with our Earth, such as the Eiffel Tower in France and the Pyramids of Egypt. Now we don't see exactly where Wuzzleberg is located because it's off screen, but based off this travel line, we can see where it is in relation to France. So we're moving Southwest from there. So my guesstimation is that we're somewhere in South America, which would also make sense with the varied ecosystems and many rainforests we see there. On the contrary though, Google is telling me that based on this shot and fly us to the moon, people say that they're located somewhere in Washington? And I just fully disagree. One more thing about Wuzzleberg before moving on, in the first half of the very last episode, Run for Fun, we see the very first Wuzz Olympic Games, which also goes back to the very founding of Wuzzleberg. And in this flashback or reenactment, what we're seeing is cave people. Then it cuts to an ancient Greece looking scene which not to let the little amount of Greek pride I have shine through, but this is where the actual Olympics started. So this implies that not only were the Was Olympics founded before the actual Olympics, but also that Wuzzleberg was the first civilization before even Mesopotamia. What do we do with this information? What will you learn? That your actions have consequences! Could you even believe that even after the ones I listed in the friendship section, that there's still more I need to get off my chest? Season one, episode 16a, we see the characters in a bit of a rut, longing for a change of scenery, which I feel like is a normal and healthy feeling to have. So they go to Plaidville, which is a place over the Wuzzleberg Mountains where everything is plaid. And after less than a day, they get sick of it immediately. By the end of the episode, we also learn about Spotsville, and when they get invited there, they're like, no thanks, we like our home. In season two, episode 4b, Daisy's new
new friend, the Unihorn, runs away after getting scared when Wubsy's kickity kickball pops. And this is while Wubsy is supposed to be watching the Unihorn for Daisy. When she comes back and Wubsy explains, Daisy is totally fine with that. Like, she's not mad at Wubsy at all. Daisy is better than me because I would have freaked out. His cute privilege is wearing off and he can't keep getting away with this. Also, the cartoony conflict in the episode Wubsy the Hero could have had some serious consequences. I'm talking Willy the Operatic Whale level consequences, which by the way, I watched that for the first time last week and I am absolutely inconsolable. What the hell? Why did they have to do that? If you've never seen Willy the Operatic Whale, probably don't unless you want to sob. I'm not even joking. Anyway, sorry. In Wubsy the Hero, Wubsy has a dinosaur friend. And after a misunderstanding, the town thinks that this friend is dangerous. Because while Wubsy and the dinosaur were playing tag, it looked like he was being chased. So the town, thinking that Wubsy chased a monster away, starts celebrating him. And while Wubsy did try to correct them twice, he gave up on explaining once he realized that he was being called a hero, he'd get a celebration, he'd get a cake. So he let the town think that his friend was this vicious, evil monster. Wubsy began to play into this and pretend even farther. And when it was revealed he was lying, it was more so about how the town felt lied to. The friend's feelings are never acknowledged. It just feels like a bizarre ending and takeaway. Like, aren't you mad, dude? Wouldn't you feel hurt by this realization? An example of a good lesson in the series is in the next episode, The Nasty Nose. So apparently these characters can get a physical change in their appearance. For example, a differently shaped polka dotted nose, like it's an illness. But these changes do not hurt and do not hinder this person's ability to live their life. But there is a lot of shame around it. The lesson of the episode and the song that played afterwards, Different People, is that we shouldn't be ashamed of the way we look and that our differences make us special. And I kinda loved it. It's a nice full circle moment to what Wubsy learned in the very first episode. Season two, episode 8B is the first time we've seen the kids in school since its introduction in season one, episode 10A. And instead of Walden being the teacher, now they're being taught by Miss Appletree, who in my opinion is an absolute shit teacher. She turned every single lesson into a competition, including show and tell. Bitch, how do you win show and tell? I don't think that's very healthy or helpful in an educational environment. Yes, I am saying it. Give me a participation trophy in the form of a silver play button because I think we're all winners. And lastly, season two, episode 2A, this is the second time Wubsy got overzealous at a dangerous job and got rewarded for it. The first time he explicitly went against Mumu the Magic Man's instructions, and at the end of the episode he became an apprentice. And in this episode, everyone told him don't rush into trouble, call the actual firefighters. But then when he did the opposite of what they said, they made him an honorary firefighter at the end of the episode. Where is the line between bravery and carelessness? This is the end of the lesson section, but I'm still not done because now we're ranking songs! Oh yeah! I will be ranking some of the songs featured in Wow Wow Wubsy because almost all of them have a lesson and some of them are so bizarre and strange and bad and some of them are surprisingly deep. You don't realize how necessary this is until we begin. First song at the end of the first episode is Look Don't Touch. Look, 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 don't touch. It's catchy, but that's a given. The lesson is not bad, but it's also not memorable. The strangest thing is when they need a rhyme and they have to force it so much that the lyric doesn't make sense. So in this song, there's a lyric that goes, you better run, you better hide, you better not ever look inside, which sounds so threatening. So for that alone, we're gonna put it in, what do you mean by that? The second song of the series, Pet Party, is bittersweet for me because while on the surface, it's a cute song about showing off your pet and the suit see unique traits it has, and it also has a killer breakdown. Billy has his Oracle, Johnny has his knee. <laughs> but unfortunately, this is the last time we see Wubsy's pet Flegel. I don't know what happened to her, and it makes me sad, but the song is very aggressively okay. The song Ask for a Little Help is legendary. Aside from it positively slapping, it has a lesson that's so good, it's timeless. Like, it's all right to ask for a little help is a nice message to hear at any age. One of the best. Perfect Day starts to dabble in what some people might call toxic optimism. Now at this point I was unconvinced, but starting to get a weird feeling. Because while the overall song tries to talk about gratitude and a more positive perspective shift, I feel like being grateful for what you have doesn't necessarily have to turn into this chorus of it's a perfect day. Clearly it's not. Not every day has to be perfect. That's okay. I know it sounds like I'm picking a fight with a jolly little ditty, but I swear I'm not, okay? You will see what I'm talking about as this list progresses. That one's going in, no, no, no. You Gotta Be Free had a really good message until the line, 
free to be smart, so don't be. Like the whole song was talking about how you have the choice to be anyone you want to be and be anything you want to be. So I think I have the right to be a little stupid, jerk ass. Also, the word you said isn't the best to use nowadays, so yeah. Stinky alert, and you were so close. The You're a Star song speaks to me because, <laughs> obviously. The message is everyone is great at something, so shine at it. And I feel as though this will affect people differently based on where they're at in life. Kids will probably be empowered to try new things and try and find what they're good at. And people who know they're good at something or multiple things will feel good. But I just know there's teens and adults raging and thrashing to this song. I wouldn't label this song as toxic positivity, but it's very surface level. Some could blame this on the medium of kids shows in general, but because I've consumed way more than the average person should, I don't think the lack of emotional depth comes from the medium. I think it's more so they have a new song for like almost every episode. That's a lot. So yes, it's more of a jingle than a ballad. So while this song didn't get to the complexity of, and even if you're really not good at one particular thing, you still deserve happiness and joy and just keep trying. I don't think they were thinking of that angle and wanted to keep it short and sweet. Maybe too sweet, but still, I think it's good. On the flip side, the song Magic talks about how everyone learns at their own speed and the frustration that comes with that, but you're still doing magic no matter how fast or slow you learn. Listen to this bar. It's magic when you try your best. Look in the mirror and use that as an affirmation. Mwah, perfect. It, it's one of the best. The Waiting Song is also really good. The importance of patience and realizing not everything is about instant gratification. Speaking of which, Wow Wow Wubsy has an official TikTok. Let's take an intermission because we need to look at that. Shout out to TikTok user Moss Pathway for bringing this to my attention. They are verified and I do have more followers than them. <laughs> Ratio. <laughs> that was pathetic. They haven't posted in 2023, so they're playing on the nostalgia. They're being like, I'm coming back for you, baby. You know those videos that are just like, all they say is, does anyone remember this? And there's the likes come in. And okay, sorry, I have a bit of a conspiracy theory and this sounds very big headed of me, but sometimes I feel like I put out lore videos and then like two days later, somebody will tweet, does anybody remember the show? And it'll get so many likes and I just have to get ahead of the curve. I got to tweet out, does anybody remember Wow Wow Wubsy before, before my video comes out? So maybe I'll get the likes. All they said is what is Wubsy? And they tried to bait Robert Irwin into answering the question. I don't think he was interested did. <laughs> One of the comments says, you tell us. And you know what? Valid. Like, wouldn't you know? Aren't you Wow Wow Wubsy official? Back to the songs. And I swear there's a point to this. The Don't Lie song is okay. It doesn't really give us a reason not to lie other than people will find out, which just feels like a command followed by a threat. I'm conflicted because their reasoning is bad, but the tune is so catchy. Uh, bad, bad. Life is filled with treasure had this piratey feel after the pirate episode, which was cute. Finding joy in the small things and an experience. I subscribed to that, you subscribe to me. <laughs> but they kept sprinkling in messages of, you can have fun every single day. It's a mindset. Like, no, it's not. It's only a mindset to a point. You can't possibly have a good time every single day. Other emotions are important. Have you ever even watched in Inside Out. Where is the Wubsy song about embracing icky emotions so you can fully heal? It's certainly not the next one. The Be Happy song is the epitome of where these songs go wrong. This one I can actually confidently label as toxic positivity. This is what I've been joking about for this whole section, but to the highest degree. They literally sang, when you've got the blues and you're feeling kind of bad, if you're down in the dumps and super duper sad, be happy, be happy, be happy, 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 happy. It's like, oh man, why didn't I think of that? Also, the imagery of these flashing smiley faces makes me feel like I'm being hypnotized. And the only way I know I'm not is I don't feel any happier. This reminds me of a cringe song I wrote when I was nine that I read out in a cringe YouTube video from 2018. Here's a clip. There are some sad things in the world, though. Yes, you have a good life. You can't be upset. So as you can see from this real life anecdotal evidence, messages of fully forced optimism actually guilt trips people sometimes. I must admit though, after listening to it, writing a toxic positivity anthem filled with just the worst advice sounded super fun. So that's exactly what I did. Please enjoy this very bad Be Happy inspired song. Oh no, you're crying, that's not okay. Save those tears for another day. 
A springy rat dude is judging you. Brown upside down, yeah, fix that toot. Trauma, Trauma please ignore sad feelings, that's a bore. Just push it down some more. No one will like a non-happy guy, so show me all your teeth and make sure they're white. Yup, now I'm lecturing you about dental hygiene. Your breath is stinky and your face is mean. Why, Why don't you like what I'm telling you? Try not to be a miserable bitch. For once. For once. Wow, that was weird as shit. I hope some of you are still here. Now for an actual downer, and I've never done this in the lore series before, but I have to talk about this show's use of ableist language in an episode. Namely, the season one episode, Mr. Cool. TV Tropes even pointed out that when this episode came out, they had the foresight to change the word in the UK dub. So it's so interesting that they wouldn't just stick to the safer UK version throughout. However, for context, this came out around the same time as the SpongeBob SquarePants movie, where they use that same word. I remember when I was eight quoting that specific line and it makes me really uncomfortable to think about because I truly did not have the context for what I was saying. And I know there's going to be some people in the comments asking what the big deal is. And while I'm not here to give an ethics lesson for people who have already made up their mind, I will leave resources in a pinned comment for people who genuinely want to learn more. I just know what my values are. I wanted to present the facts, show how times have changed, and I wanted to warn people in case they want to rewatch if they want to skip that episode if it's upsetting to them. Sorry it got a bit real there, but I would just feel bad if I skimmed over that. Let's talk about the specials because there is a lot. Wubsy's big movie actually has me livid. I already hate clip shows where the entire episode is like, remember when this thing happened? And they just play clips from previous episodes. But this takes it to the next level by not only playing clips, they play out the full episode and present it as a movie. When in this hour and 16 minute runtime, there's only six minutes of the show we haven't seen yet. That means that an hour and 10 minutes of this movie is just episodes we've already seen. And YouTube wanted me to pay for that when the series itself is up for free. So in the six minutes of actual movie, there were some interesting parts. Wubsy loses his memory, which is the catalyst for all these, remember when this happened? Moments. But anyway, when he forgets Widget and Walden, he exclaims, I was told never to talk to strangers. And my question is, who told you that? Widget and Walden seem like the people who would have told you that. Then another big part of Wubsy losing his memory is that he keeps mooing. Logically, with the format of the show, I can just conclude that that's supposed to be a ha-ha random equals funny moment. But it got me thinking. Did cows raise Wubsy? And those were the only two things I gathered, so I'm really happy I didn't pay for what is essentially a short. Now for the moment you've all been waiting for. <laughs> How did Nickelodeon afford such a highly involved cameo from B? Beyonce. How did they get away with this? The Wub Idol movie slash special lasted from season 2 episode 18 to episode 21. In the behind the scenes clips promoting the special, it genuinely seemed like Beyonce was having the time of her life. And I'm shine! I was very interested in recording a role. And Nickelodeon was very smart to only ask for one song from her. It was catchy and cute and fun and they replayed it to death, but I will say Wubsy did not earn his feature, where he's just where he's just saying wow wow in the song. No bars were dropped from Wubsy. Let me describe the journey. So first it starts with Wubsy being the only hipster in Wuzzleburg who has never heard of the Wub Girls. And yet he's the one to give them a tour of the town just by sheer luck. Next, the Wub Girls are judging Wub Idol, where the winner gets to perform with them in Wuzzlewood. Now they were a bit disheartened to see everyone in town act like them, sing like them, dance like them, because they wanted something original. Someone true to themselves. Someone like... Can you guess who it is? It's Wubsy. Obviously. Now here's the thing. Daisy did the same dance routine as everyone else, so I get why they didn't choose her. Widget made an invention that made her sound exactly like the Web Girls, which is essentially just lip syncing, so I understand why they didn't choose Widget. Imagine I'm able to lip sync here. That was amazing. I'm gonna make you a star. But Walden played three different instruments at once. Like, okay, he covered one of your songs, sure, but that's actually, that's cool as fuck. Walden should have won easily. So after being given this amazing opportunity, 
Wubsy runs away right before they're about to board the jet for Wuzzlewood. As unprofessional as his little stunt was, I can't fully blame him. He's a child traveling alone with a bunch of strangers. The resolution at the end of this episode, however, is that Widgeon, Walden, and Daisy will join him on his trip. If he just talked this out with everybody instead of running away. Why are you running? Why are you running? This whole episode could have been skipped. Next episode, Walden is the bad guy for wanting to be on time for Wubsy's rehearsal. And Wubsy, being the one who took on this responsibility, completely understands. I'm just kidding. He sets up a decoy and runs away from his friends off the van while they're still traveling so he can go to an amusement park. You know, the friends he guilted into going with him on this trip in the first place. Yeah, he ditches them. Also, the Wub girls were also at the theme park, so it seems like Walden is the only person who actually values other people's time. But, but no, no, Walden's a stinky buzzkill. Boo, this is who the episode's telling us not to be like. Next up, season two, episode 20A, Wubsy's Big Makeover. This is when Wubsy enters his industry plant poser era. They give him a new personality and a new group of friends. So while this is a short-lived thing, imagine being Widget Walden and Daisy, who again, we're dragged on this journey, being ditched for the second time. Now it's time for the concert, and Wubsy has stage fright. Understandable, I guess, but why is he worried about singing? There is not one song where Wubsy has to be doing all of this. This is his actual feature in the song. So why is he worried about hitting a high C when all he has to do is speak? In the last episode of the Wub Idol series, Wubsy's actually getting acting gigs now. But he quits so he can go home with his friends. This show puts friendship above everything else, and I understand where they're operating, but your friendships with people should not be dependent on seeing them 24-7. Oh. I'm sorry, wait one second. Athena, we want to have you be a featured creator at VidCon! Oh my gosh, that's a dream of mine! I would love to- Actually, something came up. I can't. Aww. And that's the special. In conclusion, how much did they pay Beyonce to be in that? Beyonce wasn't the only celebrity cameo, and the others were arguably even more confusing. We have Tiki Barber, a professional football player, Olympic athlete, and current United States ambassador to Belize, Michelle Kwan, and Ty Ty Pennington from Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Uh? What? They even gave his character the same megaphone he uses in the show, and the whole episode was Wubsy and his friends home renovating. It was wild. Every cameo I mentioned, they were playing themselves, and I want that. I want that for me. Put my Wubsona in your shows, in your fan cams, anywhere. Please. The cancellation of the show is a total mystery. I was searching and searching and I couldn't find anything on it. And with all these celebrity cameos and season two really feeling like it was revving up, it didn't make sense to me. If I were to guess why the show ended, and I feel like I'm gonna piss off a lot of Wow Wow Wubsy fans with this one, but the That's Kooky Kid, I hate him, dude. He is the worst. And I know for a fact that as a kid, I would I would also find him annoying. This isn't just an adult thing. The joke never landed. As I started watching the show, I was afraid I wouldn't have a lot to talk about, and it ended up being one of my longest scripts yet. And I still have a lot more to talk about, in all honesty, so keep a lookout on my shorts. I have more to say about this dude. I don't know how, but I do. And I really, really hope you enjoyed. As always, let me know what you want to see next. I have an ever-growing list, and I'm not stopping anytime soon. And if you enjoyed, please subscribe to the channel. Your support means the world to me. And as always, have a great day. Bye!